lectures. Joining us today, Sadna Radhakumar, Aureli Busi, and Jenna Adams. And um, we are going to have it structured in a way that each um, presenter will have around 10 minutes to give a talk, uh, focus on their research, which all of it is very nicely um, related to each other, but also very unique. And then we'll have five minutes of dedicated Q&A following each of the talks in which I'll be moderating. So feel free to type in your questions in the chat box during the talk, um, but please make sure you refrain from unmuting your mic or um, trying to interrupt during the talk just so we can keep on time. And I'll make sure that if you have a question that it gets asked during the Q&A period. Um, other than that, I just want to note that we will be back next month on May 26 at 11 a.m. with our theme on cognitive neuroscience, and that will be featuring Dr. Tracy Riggins. And then we also have two early career researchers that will be joining us, but we need to make sure that we can confirm uh, the time works for them. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Raban. Yes, thank you, Kelsey, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker for today, who is Sadna Ravikumar. Uh, so Sadna is a bioengineering PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. She's working under the supervision of Dr. Paul Yushkevich. Uh, our current research focuses on developing improved MRI biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease by integrating uh, information from high resolution ex vivo MRI imaging and uh, digital histopathology. So today she will be sharing our work uh, characterizing middle temporal lobe neurodegeneration due to Alzheimer's disease using ex vivo MRI and histopathology. Thanks, Robin. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to present my work here today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about my work on characterizing medial temporal lobe neurodegeneration um, due to Alzheimer's using ex vivo MRI and histopathology. Um, so, before I get into the details, I just want to take the time first to acknowledge the large group of people um, behind this work. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the tissue donors and their families, as well as the long list of collaborators we have both here at Penn and at UCLM who have put a lot of effort into this project at the different stages. Um, so in Alzheimer's disease, the earliest manifestations of neurofibrillary tangle pathology or tau pathology occur in a specific location of the MTL known as the transentrinal region um, that's at the border of the lateral and trinal cortex and the medial portion of Borden area 35. And starting from this region, the spread of tau follows a very characteristic pattern of spread as described by Brock and Brock in early autopsy studies. Um, so from the transentorhinal region, the NFD spread laterally to the rest of the entorhinal cortex um, before spreading to the rest of the MTL as the disease progresses and eventually to other cortical regions of the brain. And um, this accumulation of tau pathology is strongly correlated with neurodegeneration and measures of this resulting MTL atrophy can be quantified using structural MRI and are established biomarkers for the intermediate stages of Alzheimer's. Um, however, one of the challenges is um, when you're trying to measure this MTL atrophy that is that there are several other neurodegenerative pathologies such as TDP43, alpha synuclein, and even the process of normal aging that also cause structural changes in the MTL. Um, however, it is thought that different subregions of the MTL are differentially affected by the different pathologies as shown in this figure. And so by obtaining granular measurements of the MTL in regions that are affected specifically by tau pathology, we can improve the sensitivity and specificity of our in vivo MRI biomarkers. And so towards this goal, um, we're trying to understand these regional differences in pathology. Um, some of the limitations of um, current approaches is that 
our current understanding of the underlying pathology is based on 2D slices of histology that are usually taken from one or two sections, when in reality there is a complex 3D structure to the underlying pathology that we don't know too much about. Anatomical variety of the MTL in terms of cortical folding patterns, um, as well as the depth of cortical falci, um, which makes normalizing MTL anatomy very challenging. And lastly, um, most studies have been conducted in vivo and are therefore limited by the lower resolution of in vivo images. And so to address some of these challenges, we are combining ex vivo imaging using ex vivo MRI, the MTL, and serial histopathology which allowed us to provide a direct link between MRI measures of MTL structure and the underlying pathology. And we hypothesized that in vivo MRI biomarkers that are defined over MTL regions where structural change correlates specifically with tau pathology as opposed to other non-AD factors um, would be more sensitive to disease progression during the early stages of the disease. So to briefly describe our um, ex vivo imaging pipeline, um, following fixation, we scan our MTL specimens at 9.4 Tesla MRI at a resolution of 200 microns isotropic. And then we print 3D custom moles for each specimen, which includes cutting guides for the cutting the histology tissue blocks. And by using this approach, we know where exactly in MRI space each of the tissue blocks are located, which makes the process of aligning the MRI and histology more accurate and less labor intensive. Um, following sectioning, we um, process the sections with staining for cytoarchitecture, as well as immunohistochemistry for tau pathology. And lastly, we reconstruct the scanned histology tissues um, into the 3D volume and align them to MRI space using a custom 3D deformable registration pipeline. Um, additionally, we have a web-based histology annotation system, which contains all of our histology data. Um, so using this system, the team at UCLM are able to mark the boundary annotations between the different MTL subregions directly on the histology images. Um, the histology data are then um, reconstructed in 3D and warped into the space of the MRI scans. So here you see corresponding histology and MRI um, slices with the boundary annotations overlaid. Um, and then using this, the MTL subfield labels are then traced in MRI space guided by the histology image. And here I show just an example reconstruction of this histology derived subregion segmentation for one specimen. So given this pipeline and the large data set of XBIVA MRI data that we have, my work has focused um, on constructing a probabilistic atlas of the MTL. And this involves performing group-wise registration across all the specimens to create a common reference space for our group-wise analysis. Um, so the current atlas that I've built contains scans from 29 specimens. And once we have this atlas, I can then characterize anatomical variability in the MTL and also look at correlations between MTL structure and pathological markers. So to better handle the complex geometry of the MTL and the high resolution of our data, um, we've developed a customized access construction pipeline that takes the MRI scans as well as segmentations of the MTL and the SRLM to guide the registration process. Um, so since manual segmentation would be very tedious, I first developed a semi-automated method for um, segmenting the MTL and SRLM in each of our MRI scans. If you're here, I show an example in one specimen. Um, and then once I've had these, I then perform group-wise registration using both the shape and the intensity information. And on the right, you see the final atlas, which captures the average shape of the MTL and the SRLM. Um, once I perform group-wise registration, I then use those transformations to map the histology-derived subregion segmentations, which we currently have completed in nine specimens, um, into the space of the atlas. Um, and I generated this consensus segmentation by performing majority voting across the nine specimens. 
And we are currently working on completing segmentations in a larger number of specimens. And the idea is that once we have this, it can then provide ground truth for MTL anatomy. So once I developed the atlas, we were interested in looking at the association between MTL structure and pathological measures of tau while correcting for the effects of TDP43 and age. Um, so for 28 out of the 29 specimens, um, we have semi-quantitative pathological data that's provided by an expert pathologist. So for each specimen, the contralateral hemisphere was sampled at the time of autopsy and ratings were provided for tau pathology and TDP43 pathology in the antrinal cortex, dentate gyrus, and CA region on a scale of zero to three, where zero is no pathology and three is severe pathology. I then looked at each point along the MTL and SRLM surface at the correlation between pointwise thickness and the tau pathology ratings while correcting for age and TDP43. So this figure on the right shows the T-statistic map, and here I show the same result overlaid on the consensus MTL subregion segmentation. Um, since it's hard to see the hippocampus here, I've shown it again here with the extra hippocampal regions removed. And you see um, the black clusters indicate regions where we see strong correlations between tau and thickness. Um, and they correspond to the lateral entrinal cortex um, to going towards the transentrinal region, um, as well as the subiculum CA1 region of the hippocampus. So these results are consistent with what was described in the early Brock stages, and also are consistent with in vivo studies that have looked at the association between thickness and tau pet. Um, I wanted to lastly discuss some of my more recent work, which is um, looking at the same relationship between tau and MTL structure, but in an unfolded space. Um, so to do this, I applied the unfolding framework developed by DeCrocker um, to the hippocampal subfields, but now to our ex vivo MRI data. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this method due to time, but basically using this approach, you can index locations along the MTL cortex based on distance from a reference point. Um, so in the figure I've shown here, I use the whole hippocampus shown in dark blue as my reference point. And so the unfolding is applied to the extra hippocampal region predominantly. Um, and the benefit of unfolding the tissue is that it provides implicit registration across the specimens and it better handles differences in cell fold depth than folding patterns. Um, so here I have this framework that's applied to 18 specimens, looking at tau and mean curvature um, along the MTL surface. Um, for 15 of the specimens, I have quantitative maps of tau pathology, and for eight of the specimens, I have the MTL subregion segmentations. Um, so similar to what I did with the atlas, um, I computed a consensus subregion segmentation derived from these eight specimens, but now in this flattened unfolded space. And since only a subset of the subjects have this subregion segmentation, I used this average to then define an ROI um, and compute a summary measure of tau pathology for each of the subjects, which is defined as the 90th percentile of tau burden across all the points in the map that fall within BA35. Um, so in this flattened space, I can then look at the correlation between pointwise thickness and tau severity. And once again, we see similar results with um, significant correlations between thickness and tau in the entorhinal cortex um, and parts of BA36. So to conclude, um, using ex vivo imaging, um, we can directly correlate MTL structural changes with the underlying pathology. Um, and this allows us to define regional hotspots where AD pathology correlates most strongly with MTL structural change. And this allows us to also validate the findings reported in in vivo MRI literature. Um, additionally, um, ex vivo imaging allows us to understand the anatomical variation and anatomical boundaries within the MTL. Um, my future work will be focused on incorporating the quantitative NFT burden maps um, into the atlas to describe the distribution of tau across the BRAC stages in 3D. And I'll also be focusing on applying the unfolding framework to a large number of specimens and also incorporating the hippocampal subfields um, within the unfolded space. 
Um, and with that, I wanted to uh, conclude. Um, I also wanted to quickly mention that our lab is looking to hire a postdoc. So I highly recommend our group. And if anyone's interested, feel free to scan the QR code for more details. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so Christine has shared a question in the chat, which I'll read out loud and then you two can continue the conversation. Um, so she asked, was this method developed on healthy specimens or a mix of disease and healthy specimens? Yeah, so our data set contains a mix of um, healthy specimens, specimens spanning the spectrum of AD and also specimens with non-AD um, diseases. Yeah. Great. And what what scans should it, you say that this can kind of be used for ground truth for in vivo data? Mm -hmm. um, what scans would need to be obtained for the in vivo data to be able to use your this exciting new um, method that you got here? Yeah. So I, for at least a subset of our specimens, we have the corresponding in vivo MRI scan for the same specimen. Um, that we have their ex vivo MRI scan. And so the idea is that we can match up their ex vivo scan with their seven Tesla in vivo scan to map the two domains. Mm -hmm. But let's, if you didn't have a 7T, could someone get, like what scans would you need to get on a normal scanner to be able to use, use this method? Or is it for people that have 7T data? I think the idea is to map for the case that we do have in vivo scans to map the segmentations into that space and generate a in vivo template, which can then be applied to a wider range of in vivo scans, not necessarily seven tests. Well. Okay, and then in order to apply it to those data, what do you need? Does the, T, the T1 and high res T2, or do you need something else? I think so. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next question um, is, thank you for the presentation. I can, oh, no, I missed one. Um, so FreeSurfer also has hippocampal subfield segmentations, I think. Is it okay to rely on its results, which I know is a, a, a bit of a can of worms to go into. Um, so if you want to, to answer broadly, compared to your method? Well, I think the protocol used for segmentation is very different. So uh, I think it should be an alternative <laughs> segmentation. Yeah, I think it's still an ongoing conversation and the, um, the purpose of the hippocampal subfield group is to provide something that can be more precisely labeled down to uh, draw consensus across groups. So I don't think that any of us would say, you know, you can't use free server, but there may be some d differences in the results because they're using right. a different, you know, they're using a different probabilistic atlas that, and different sort of combinations of subfields. Right. I don't know if you'd concur, but I will, I know that that's a tricky one. Um, okay. One more question, um, just so we can to make sure we have time and I'll come back to if there's more at the end. This is the one thanking you for the presentation. Again, I concur. Uh, is your web-based histology annotation system publicly available or available by request? It is not publicly available right now. Um, I'm not sure if it is available by request yet. Okay, so keep tuned. Um, stay tuned. It looks like you have one of those, your papers that's in review right now, and maybe we'll hear some more about the system as that comes out. Yeah, hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And then I know that I missed one question. If we have time, I will circle back to it at the end. I can also just check in the chat. Okay. Okay, so yeah. Thanks again, Sadna. It was excellent. Um, so it's time to move to our second uh, speaker. 
who is Aurelie Bussy. Uh, Aurelie is a PhD candidate in the Integrated Program of Neuroscience at McGill University under the supervision of Dr. Malash Akravati. And her current uh, research involves uh, investigating the hippocampus in physio physiological and pathological aging using multi-contrast and multimodal imaging techniques. Uh, and today she will be sharing her work, uh, effects of MR uh, sequence on hippocampal subfields volume and relationship between hippocampal shape and age. Uh, yeah, so hi everybody, thank you for being here and thank you Robert for the introduction. Uh, I would like also to thank again the Hippocampal Circuit Group uh, for their uh, invitation to talk today. I'm very excited to share my work. Um, so as Robin just said, I'm going to talk about the effect of MR sequence on hippocampal circuit volumes and the relationship between hippocampal shape and age. Okay, so just uh, to give you a brief introduction of my uh, research. Uh, so uh, as you probably all know, the hippocampus is a very important uh, structure located in the medial temporal lobe. And while it has been um, much in, uh, studied in the context of pathological aging, such as Alzheimer's disease, there's still a lot of uncertainty in how healthy aging impacts the hippocampus. And here, for example, looking at whole hippocampus, this uh, study, I found that there is no uh, age-related changes of volumes, while some other papers have found that there is a decrease of volumes after a follow-up of five years. And as you probably all know, the hippocampus is not uh, an homogeneous uh, structure. Here, for example, uh, looking at a, a high resolution ex vitro MRI or with uh, a stain for a myelin, we can see that there is a lot of inhomogeneities within the hippocampus um, because of different cell types. And therefore, people have started to try to look at more uh, detailed uh, definition within the hippocampus. And as you probably know, this paper, um, they, they were, so they asked different labs, so about 20 different labs to uh, define the subfields according to their own protocol uh, in the same uh, MRI sequence. And as you can see, there is a lot of variability of segmentation uh, within the, uh, between these different groups, which could explain why we have a lot of different uh, findings in the literature in healthy aging. And in addition to that, there is a lot of different segmentation protocol, as we just discussed before. Uh, knowingly, there is manual segmentation, but there is also a lot of different automated segmentation, such as maggot brain, presurfer, ashes, keeps, and hippodip. And in the context of my research, I am using maggot brain. And also, this paper from Cooper et al. in 2019 uh, nicely demonstrated that the volumes change in a quadratic relationship with age. Uh, with the volume being preserved until the age of 60 and then showing this decline. And in the literature, uh, people who are looking at healthy aging um, sometimes are looking at only elderly individuals. So most of the time, uh, people older than 60 years old, uh, while some of them want to re-characterize the entire lifespan. And therefore, because of this quadratic evolution with age, we can understand that taking different age range could also uh, explain why we have so many different uh, findings in the literature. And finally, there is also a uh, big importance of the type of scans that we are using. So here you have an example of a T1 weighted images of uh, uh, one millimeter isotropic resolution, which is the most standard um, MRI sequence in the field of neuroimaging. But here, if we are looking at the hippocampus in this zoomed uh, figure, we can see that uh, the resolution is quite low and it is really hard to differentiate between the different subfields here. And this is why people have started to use another type of scans, which I will call slab in this uh, presentation. And here it is uh, a, a scan with uh, anisotropic voxels with high resolution in the coronal plane. Here 0.4 and 0.4 millimeter resolution, um, which allow us to really see nicely uh, the shape of the hippocampus and the different subfields. However, this uh, type of scan has a drawback of having very low resolution in the anterior to posterior axis, as you can see in here, uh, with two millimeter resolution in uh, usual. And in the context of my research, we want to introduce another kind of uh, uh, sequence, which is a T2 weighted images um, of 0.6 isotropic uh, resolution. So we can still have a pretty good resolution in the coronal view. And we also have a good resolution in the anterior to posterior axis. 
So in the context of my first uh, uh, presentation, I'm going to really focus on the age range and the way we model age and uh, the resolution and the contrast. So in order to, uh, to do this study, we use five data sets. Two of them are open access, ADMI and CAMCAN, and three of them are uh, coming from my lab. For all of these different data sets, we have T1 one millimeter isotropic uh, scans, uh, for the scans acquired in my lab, we had a T2 isotropic scan. And for the ADMI and test retest, we had these anisotropic slab scans. So in total, we had uh, 665 participants with an age range between 18 and 93, and about 58% of females. So for the processing, we started with a quality control in order to, to remove scans with motion artifacts, such as in this example. And then we use Link B5 library pipeline, uh, which is uh, a tool developed by Dr. Gabriel Bellini in my lab, and which is a pipeline, pipeline uh, gathering a lot of different pre-processing steps, such as N4 correction and brain extraction. And then we applied maggot brain algorithm to segment the hippocampal gray matter subfield and the hippocampal uh, white matter subregions. And finally, for the statistics, we use linear mixed effects models. We use AK information criterion in order to select the best uh, model. And we use sex ICD and the hippocampal volume for the fixed effects. And we use data set MRI sequence and subject idea as random effects in order to correct as much as we can uh, for the variability between our data sets. And we use von Fernie correction uh, to correct for multiple comparisons. So here is the first uh, results. So it is buzzy slide. So uh, each plot is one subfield. Uh, and here in the x-axis, we are not looking at volumes per se, but we are looking at the relative proportion of each individual subfield volume um, when normalized by the ICV and the hippocampal volume. So if we focus on the CA1, for example, here, what we see is that when we take into account the global uh, brain atrophy and hippocampal atrophy, the proportion of TA1 in a healthy aging actually increased with age, while we see a decrease with age for the CA2, CA3, and the stratum. And then we looked at the different age relationship using only T1 or T2 uh, in blue and slab in green. And uh, here again, just to guide you a little bit in these results, um, if we are looking at CA2, CA3, or the Pimperia, we can see that no matter which type of scan we're using, uh, the age relationship is pretty similar. However, for the CA4 dental gyrus in the phonics, we do see very similar relationship for the T when we, do, we use T1 and T2 scans. However, with slab scans, we see a very big uh, decline with age in this region and the phonics. Uh, and in contrary, we see that T1 and T2 still show pretty similar uh, age relationship. However, SLAB also see, uh, show this big difference in age relationship. So in order to make sure that our results uh, showing that SLAB demonstrate different age relationship compared to the other two MRI sequence, uh, we're not driven by uh, contrast to noise ratio reduction. We tested that for each of the um, different modalities that we had, and there is no CNR change with age. But then we also wanted to check if our results were not driven by the uh, methodological uh, techniques that we used, uh, because maggot brain was originally not um, uh, developed to segment anisotropic scans. Uh, and therefore, we compared our results with ASHES technique. Um, and while you can see that um, there is big uh, baseline difference in volume, um, there is no differences in the age relationship for none of the subfields. And we, we would expect these big baseline differences because of the fact that we are not using the same atlases. And this result confirms that maggot brain was able to capture the age relationship uh, uh, in a proper way. And one hypothesis that we have regarding the fact that slab images seems to show different age relationship is that slab images have been created, as I mentioned at the beginning, to have high resolution in the coronal plane. Uh, which is where there is the most complicated structure within subfields. Um, and also, uh, it is based on the fact that along the anterior to posterior axis, the hippocampus subfields are known to be quite consistent throughout. Uh, and therefore, in the ideal uh, situation, when the anterior to posterior axis is aligned or parallel to the uh, axis of the anisotropic voxels, 
um, then the slab images are perfectly uh, uh, appropriate. However, there is a growing literature showing that with uh, in aging, there is actually a curvature of the hippocampal uh, shape with age. Uh, and th in this context, the anterior to posterior axis will not be a straight line anymore. And therefore, this uh, high resolution of the, in the coronal plane will not follow um, perfectly and throughout uh, the hippocampus axis. So in order to uh, dive into uh, more about the shape, we, uh, we wanted to look at, uh, at the shape uh, with age. And also this paper nicely showed that while we didn't, they didn't see uh, an evolution of the volumes with age, when they used shape index instead, they found this cubic relationship, which demonstrated that maybe the shape could be more sensitive to uh, aging than volumes. Uh, so this is why we looked at the hippocampus shape across the axial lifespan and its relationship with cognition. So in order to do that, we use Maget Morph, which gives us two surface-based uh, metrics. The first one is the surface area, where we are looking at the surface area in the reference brain and the surface area in any kind of brain, and we compare the surface area. And if the surface area in the brain uh, here is bigger, that means that the brain uh, surface area enlarged, or it can also be reduced. And the other metric is the displacement, where we are looking at if the brain uh, had a displacement outward of the structure compared to a reference brain or inward the structure. So for this uh, study, we used the ADB and LC gene data sets from my lab, uh, for which we had all this information. So we had APOE4 status, education, airband, and NMLC. And for our analysis, for each vertex, we tried three models, one where we modeled age as a first order relationship, one where we modeled age as a second order or third order. And then here in this map, we are looking at the uh, best model per vertex. Uh, and we selected the best model with AIC. So in purple, you can see that this vertex demonstrated best model with a linear fit, while for the blue, uh, we can see a second order fit and for yellow, third order fits. And then using these best models, we looked at which one are actually significant with age. And we found that there is a linear decrease, uh, mostly in the uh, body and tail of the hippocampus, while the, head and, uh, while the head of the hippocampus demonstrated either second order or third order relationship with age. And then, so we also took these best models again, and we can also uh, plot in these maps uh, at which age the surface area was the maximum or minimum. And if we focus on the maximum here, uh, we can see that in the head, the surface area was maximum at an age corresponding to uh, about 60 years old, while in the body and tail of the hippocampus, we can see this dark color corresponding to a very earlier age. And then again, we can plot some specific peak voxels that confirm the same uh, type of evolution, where we see a very linear uh, decrease in the uh, body and tail of the hippocampus. And where we see in the head of the hippocampus, we see this uh, kind of preservation of the surface area until the age of 60 here and here, uh, and then a fast decrease. So we did the same type of analysis for the displacement, but for a question of time, I'm not going to show it. But we also did a partial least square analysis in order to relate some cognitive and demographic uh, information with our shape information. And here we used, uh, we found one latent variable showing that increased age and lower air bands and education were related to inward uh, displacement in this region highlighted here and outward uh, displacement in this region. So basically we, we see inward displacement, mostly in the medial part of the hippocampus, and we see outward displacement in the lateral part of the hippocampus and the uncus, which demonstrated that there is this C-shape accentuation with aging. We also replicated our results using CAMCAN data set, uh, where we used 350 participants with an age between 18 and 85, I'm just going to skip this result because of time, but we have replicated the result for both surface area and displacement. And so uh, just to conclude, uh, we found that there is indeed this anterior to posterior axis in the hippocampus regarding the surface area, 
but uh, on contrary than previous studies which have used a priori uh, definition of body, head, tail, or anterior and posterior um, based on some ge geometric rules. Here we really use data-driven analysis to find this difference of evolution. And also we found this, that there is also a medial to lateral axis with the displacement, uh, where we see this inward displacement in the medial part of the hippocampus. And as these three uh, very recent papers have shown, the, the medial part of the hippocampus, which corresponds mostly to the subiculum, is the structure the most myelinated. So we could uh, hypothesize that this inward displacement in this region could be related to a decrease of myelin. And with that, just to summarize my findings, uh, so normalized by the ICB and the hippocampus, we found that the stratum and the phonics showed the highest relative volumetric impairment, and we showed that the CA1 showed a relative volumetric preservation. We found that different sequences led to different age relationship, and overall, we found smaller volumes with slab situated images. And for the shape, we did find this uh, anterior to posterior axis, where we see a relative preservation of the anterior hippocampal surface area. And for the medial to lateral axis, we see this accentuation of the C shape. And we did find some relationship with sex, cognition, and education, but not with ATO4. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all the fundings and my institution. And I would like to thank all the members of my lab, especially my supervisor, Dr. Malar Shakranat. Thank you. Wonderful, sorry. Me and Zoom still can't <laughs> click on things directly. Um, wonderful, that's so much data, which is wonderful to see such a data-driven approach and the comparison, the systematic nature of it is, um, it's fantastic. Um, so we have a question. Thank you for presenting this wonderful work. I concur. I read one of the papers from your lab which stated hippocampal subfield segmentation in 3T MRI, since at most places we don't find a high field MRI. There's one specific I would like to state. In diffusion MRI, specifically going beyond beta 1000, the signals are really poor. Is there any way to look at hippocampals in this situation? So I'm not sure I got the question. So do you mean like when we have like one millimeter of resolution scans? I, I would ask the the asker to unmute <laughs> so that they can clarify because I, I read what I read, but I don't um, want to misconstrue their question. Uh, yes, actually, I wanted to know that in diffusion MRI settings, like we take specific B values, B0, B1000, B1500, 000, B1, 000, but uh, going into the advanced diffusion, when we compute diffusion kurtosis or biophysical modeling, so in that case, we take higher B values like B2000 or 2500. So in that case, like if we want to look at hippocampus subfields, the resolution is really poor, specifically mm -hmm. in 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla MRIs. So is there any way to look at hippocampus subfields in those situations where the field strength is really low, but Diffusion MRI, B values are really high. So I'm not an expert in diffusion, but uh, regarding the fact that like in within one minute of resolution, as I showed at the beginning, like it is really hard to distinguish between the subfield. So even though some automated segmentation can be trained and try to reproduce as best as they can the subfield definition, uh, we cannot really do any quality control to really uh, assess if the segmentation was uh, accurate or not. So regarding the question, I'm not sure for the diffusion part, but uh, I would advise like anybody looking at hippocampal subfield that like the highest resolution, the better, uh, but I'm not sure like what is the uh, limit for diffusion MRI. So I don't know, sorry. Okay, yes, but I think that uh, going down to the resolution, the scan time increases significantly. So yeah. that's one problem. That, yeah, it's definitely a drawback, but uh, I know that for our type of scan that I presented, the T2 uh, isotropic, actually, I think our protocol is quite fast. I mean, relatively fast. I think we take like five minutes and a half for the acquisition, which is not fast. That's nice. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. 
Awesome. Um, does anyone else want to ask a question right now, or we can we can think about it, and I can always circle back. But I want to be um, diplomatic in making sure that those who have a question have it answered. I didn't know if you wanted to share any more details, just briefly, about the relations you found with education and cognition. Um, um, so the main thing that we saw was like lower uh, surface area linked or more displacement linked to older age and lower education, lower cognition, which to me, uh, I, I, I think it makes sense in the way that like, if we see this effect in older, and also we see a big effect in females as well, specifically. So I think that if you are looking at females of like 70 years old and more, probably at that time when they were young, they were not uh, or less educated than males due to like economic and uh, history, I guess. So I think all these factors kind of go in the same direction because of everything like this, like lower education is linked, unfortunately for this population to being female and therefore uh, lower cognition goes with it. And like probably that's also why women can be more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease or later on in life. So I think everything is kind of connected in this direction. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Raban, would you like to yeah. shift? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Aveli. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker uh, for today, who is Dr. Jenna Adams. Uh, Dr. Adams is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at UC Irvine, uh, working with uh, Dr. Mike Yasa. She completed her, PhD, her doctoral work at UC Berkeley under the supervision of Dr. William Jagist, and her current research investigates how tau pathology affects subregional hippocampal function during memory and leads to behavioral impairment in preclinical age. Uh, and today she will be sharing her work, uh, Reduced Repetition Suppression in Aging is Driven by Tau-Related Hyperactivity in Medial Temporal Lobe. So, Gina. I'd like to thank, start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to share my work today. Uh, this work I'll be sharing was part of my dissertation research at UC Berkeley with Bill Jagus. And I'd like to thank the co-authors on this project from the get-go. Okay, so uh, tau and amyloid beta are the two core pathologies of Alzheimer's disease, and they begin to de deposit in the brain decades before clinical impairment is observable. Um, while amyloid pathology arises multifocally throughout association cortex, tau occurs in a really specific pattern. Cortical tau pathology first accumulates in the medial temporal lobe, specifically in the region called the transentorhinal region, which encompasses the medial bank of the collateral sulcus. Tau then begins to spread to the entorhinal region proper, particularly the anterolateral subregion, and also to the hippocampus. This stage of tau pathology occurs in almost all cognitively normal older adults and is thought to be an age-related process. Tau then begins to intensify throughout the rest of the medial temporal lobe and then spreads to lateral temporal lobe and limbic regions in a stage that's thought to be associated with amyloid but can also be found in cognitively normal older adults. Finally, when tau spreads to association cortex, uh, this is thought to be associated with cognitive impairment and is almost exclusively found in subjects with cognitive impairment. Um, Besides being prone to tau pathology, the medial temporal lobe also demonstrates abnormal neural activity prior to the onset of cognitive decline. Studies using fMRI to assess neural activity have found that compared to young adults, older adults demonstrate this altered neural activity in regions such as the anterolateral entorhinal cortex, the hippocampus, and also the perirhinal cortex. This is really interesting because these regions are the regions that are prone to tau, so it's thought that these changes in neural activity may in fact be one of the first consequences of tau pathology prior to the onset of tau-related cognitive decline, which makes studying this really important to determine why you get these age and cognitive deficits um, as Alzheimer's disease progresses. Um, with the recent advent of um, positron emission tomography tracers that target tau pathology, we can now measure how tau pathology in the brain is related to dynamic brain processes such as activation. 
Recent studies have in fact looked at the, looked at the relationship between tau pathology with PET and neural activation with fMRI, and have found that regions such as uh, the inferior temporal lobe, tau is associated with uh, increased hippocampal activity while there is no association between amyloid and neural activity. So um, although these previous studies have found really interesting results, they've mostly focused on hippocampal activity. So we still need to know how tau affects activation in other medial temporal lobe regions that show this altered activation and aging. So the goal of the present study was to determine how the relationship between tau deposition and medial temporal lobe activity in cognitively normal older adults uh, using multimodal neuroimaging. So assessing tau with PET and neural activity with fMRI. We aim to conduct a detailed investigation of activation in all medial temporal lobe subregions, so including the anterolateral and posterior medial subregions of the entorhinal cortex, areas 35 and 36 of the perirhinal cortex, uh, the perihippocampal cortex, and the hippocampus. Uh, we assessed activation with an fMRI measure of repetition suppression. So repetition suppression is a phenomenon in which repeated stimuli show a dampened neural response compared to novel stimuli, and this has been found to show, occur throughout the medial temporal lobe. So for instance, the first time you see a stimulus, you have a robust neural response, and the second time you see a stimulus, this neural response is dampened, leading to this repetition suppression effect. And this is really interesting because repetition suppression has been found to be altered or reduced in uh, Alzheimer's disease and MCI, but has never been related to tau pathology and aging. Finally, our goal was to compare uh, older adults with low tau pathology, so restricted to the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus, to older adults with high tau pathology, so occurring throughout the medial temporal lobe, to sort of stage how the progression of tau pathology affects neural activity in the medial temporal lobe. So we hypothesized that in older adults with low tau pathology, that there would be local reductions and repetition suppression in the regions that would co-localize with the earliest tau deposition. So here being the interlateral entorhinal cortex and area 35, which together make up that transentorhinal region and also the hippocampus. In older adults with high tau pathology, we expected to see widespread reductions in repetition suppression across the medial temporal lobe. Finally, we expected to not see an association between amyloid pathology and medial temporal lobes or petition suppression activity based on previous findings. Uh, to do this, we had a sample of 45 cognitively normal older adults from the Berkeley Asian Cohort Study who received MRI and PET, and a sample of young adults who received MRI to use for baseline measures of activation. All subjects received structural MRI, a task-based functional MRI, where they performed a mnemonic discrimination task, which I'll describe more in the next slide to extract measures of neural activity, and also a high-resolution T2 image, which we used um, ASHES software to do medial temporal lobe segmentation. Uh, we further segmented the full entorhinal cortex ROI into those anterolateral and posterior medial subregions due to our interest specifically in anterolateral entorhinal cortex. And we ended up merging the hippocampus into one ROI because we did not have subfield specific hypotheses in this study. Finally, older adults received tau PET with flirtalsipir. And here uh, we used a previously published threshold from our lab to um, group subjects into either being low tau pathology. So once again, tau restricted to entorhinal cortex and hippocampus, which, which had 29 subjects, or high tau pathology where tau was occurring throughout the medial temporal lobe, which resulted in 16 subjects. We additionally extracted the mean entorhinal cortex tau signal to further investigate the origin of tau deposition in the cortex. Finally, older adults also received amyloid PET with PIB, and we extracted a global measure of amyloid burden, global PIB, and used this to classify subjects into either being amyloid positive or amyloid negative. So here is the task the subjects performed on the scanner. It's a mnemonic discrimination task where subjects see novel, repeated, and lower stimuli. Subjects are instructed to indicate old or new to each stimulus. There was also a perceptual baseline condition at the beginning and the end of each run, which allowed us to tease apart activation to specific conditions separately. So here we were interested in repetition suppression, so we contrasted the activity between novel stimuli, shown here in purple, to repeated stimuli, shown here in black, to derive a measure of repetition suppression, and we extracted the mean beta weight or activation for each medial temporal lobe ROI. So our first question was, do older adults with low tau pathology or high tau pathology show reductions in repetition suppression activity across these medial temporal lobe regions compared to young adult subjects? 
Um, just to orient everyone to this data, we have along the x-axis here are regions of interest, and on the y-axis our measure of repetition suppression activity. So here, higher repetition suppression is good. Um, the young adults are shown in light purple, older, low tau older adults in purple, and high tau older adults in dark purple. Uh, we conducted repeated measure ANOVA analyses on these data to look for main effects of group and group by region interactions. We first did find a main effect of group that indicated that overall um, there were reductions in repetition suppression from the young adults who had the highest repetition suppression to the tau negative and then finally to the tau positive who had the least repetition suppression activation. We also find, found significant group by region interactions that indicated regionally specific group differences. So we dove into these further with pairwise comparisons. Uh, we found that comparing the low tau older adults, to the young adults, we found focal reductions of repetition suppression in the hippocampus bilaterally and also the right anterior lateral entorhinal cortex, supporting our hypothesis that this early, these early tau regions would show these reductions in this group. You can specifically see in the hippocampus here, you see the stepwise pattern with really robust repetition suppression in the younger adults that diminishes in the tau negative older adults and then finally diminishes even more in the tau positive older adults. Comparing the tau positive to the tau negative older adults, you can see further reductions of repetition suppression in many more medial temporal lobe regions. And comparing this tau positive group to the young adults, once again, you see widespread reductions in repetition suppression across most of these medial temporal lobe regions. This led us to conclude that tau pathology is associated with increasing reductions of repetition in medial temporal lobe that may start focally in early tau regions and expand to encompass the rest of the medial temporal lobe as tau severity increases. We next wanted to test whether amyloid pathology was also related to reductions of repetition suppression in medial temporal lobe regions. So here now the groups are coded for young adults, amyloid negative older adults, and amyloid positive older adults. And we ran, ran similar repeated measure ANOVA analyses. So uh, while we did find that each amyloid group had reductions in repetition suppression compared to the young adults, critically, there was no difference in repetition suppression between the amyloid negative and amyloid positive groups. You can see here in the hippocampus, which I had pointed out as having a really nice stepwise reduction going across the tau groups, that the amyloid negative and the amyloid positive groups are practically equivalent here in repetition suppression activation. This led us to conclude that here, the presence of amyloid beta on its own is not associated with the reduction of repetition suppression in the medial temporal lobe. We found our tau-related repetition suppression effects really interesting and wanted to dive into the mechanisms behind this further. So reduced repetition suppression can occur through two different mechanisms. The first is a hypoactivity to novel stimuli. So less activity the first time you see the stimulus would lead to a reduction in repetition suppression. The second is hyperactivity to repeated stimuli, which would also lead to a reduction in repetition suppression. So we wanted to test in our sample what was driving our reduced repetition suppression. Was it hypoactivity to novel stimuli or hyperactivity to repeated stimuli? And to do this, we contrasted that activity to novel and repeated stimuli separately against that perceptual baseline I had measured to be able to separate the um, neural activity signal between the two conditions. So uh, first, this is now looking at activation to novel stimuli with our tau groups. And here, um, we actually did not find widespread reduction to novel stimuli. And we, in fact, did find some hyperactivity to novel stimuli in um, certain areas. So this did not support the hypothesis that hypoactivity to novel stimuli was driving our results. However, now looking at the activity to repeated stimuli, we did in fact see widespread hyperactivity to repeated stimuli that really paralleled the same patterns of results that we found with repetition suppression. So for example, in the low tau group, we see this hyperactivity in the bilateral hippocampus and then right anterior lateral entorhinal cortex once again. Uh, we did some more follow-up analyses to confirm this, which I'm not showing for the sake of time, but here we really could conclude that hyperactivity to repeated stimuli is driving our reductions and repetition suppression that are related to tau. Finally, uh, we wanted to look a little bit closer at tau pathology specifically in the entorhinal cortex because that's where it begins to develop cortically and is related to age and found in almost all older adults. So we wanted to test is tau and the entorhinal cortex related to this hyperactivity that we're finding. 
So uh, we correlated the amount of tau in the entorhinal cortex here on the x-axis with the amount of activation to both novel and repeated stimuli. And what we found was increasing levels of entorhinal tau was associated with general increased activity to both novel and repeated stimuli in hippocampus, posterior medial entorhinal cortex, and area 35. Uh, we also tested to see whether this was true using measures of amyloid beta, and there was once again no relationship with amyloid beta. Finally, there was also no interaction between amyloid beta and the amount of tau in the entorhinal cortex. So this led us to conclude that tau deposition in entorhinal cortex is associated with this general hyperactivity, and this relationship is very specific to tau and not amyloid. So to conclude our major findings, uh, we found that tau-related hyperactivation impacts the ability to deactivate to repeated stimuli, which leads to reductions in repetition suppression. Uh, we found focal activation uh, reductions in early tau regions, such as anterior lateral entorhinal cortex and hippocampus in older adults with low tau pathology. And as tau intensifies and spreads to more temporal regions, there are widespread activity changes throughout the medial temporal lobe. We found that tau was associated with hyperactivity to both novel and repeated stimuli, suggesting it's associated with a generalized gain of function that affects processing during different types of task states. Um, we found no association between global amyloid pathology and medial temporal lobe activation, which is consistent with some recent work. And then finally, uh, because our findings are cross-sectional, uh, the directionality of the relationship between tau deposition and hyperactivity is still an open question that really needs to be explored longitudinally, because while here we're inferring that tau may be driving this hyperactivity, it is also possible that hyperactivity may drive tau deposition, or there may be a bidirectional relationship between these factors. So I'd once again like to thank my co-authors from the Jagus Lab and our collaborators on this project, um, our funding sources. And um, this study was recently published as early release in Journal of Neuroscience. If anyone's interested in getting more information, uh, please reach out to me on email or Twitter. And uh, thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenna, for sharing that really elegant work. It was really nice to see the amount of teasing apart different possibilities for where those effects were coming from. Um, yes, lots of clapping in the, in, the, in the crowd, I agree. In our last couple of minutes, I, would, I want to make sure that anyone who has questions um, for Dr. Adams has the chance to ask them here, although she did offer to, to have a conversation via email. I can ask a question because I like to make sure that this went on. Um, so you mentioned the need for, for longitudinal work. I don't know, sometimes that's in the pipeline. I don't know if you have sort of plans to look at this longitudinally. Um, and if so, um, sort of what the progress or plans are for that. Yeah, so it is in the works. Um, that was actually my last dissertation project was to try to look at these phenomena longitudinally. So hopefully that will be um, submitted somewhat soon. Um, but I hope other groups are looking at it as well because it's a really fascinating question, so. Awesome. And, and Christine made the nice comment that she can't wait to see what's in store for you in Mike's lab. Yes, I'm excited to get started. All right, so Rosanna had a quick question before we close out for the day. Um, complimentary, great talk, I agree. I was just wondering if you looked at how these measures related to, to memory or other behaviors. Yeah, we did actually. So that's in the paper. I didn't include it here for the sake of time, um, but we did look at how the activation and tau was related to performance during the mnemonic discrimination task and also a neuropsych measure of episodic memory. And while tau was related to the neuropsych performance, um, there was no relationship here between the um, hyperactivity or the repetition suppression and activation with um, performance on the task or performance on the neuropsych measure. So that's something really interesting we need to tease apart more, but our sample was very highly educated. So we thought maybe there's some type of compensatory mechanism going on, or it definitely needs to be explored more. Great. All right, well, with that, I will thank everyone for hanging out for just a minute extra. 
and remind you that I will do my best to have this recording up by the end of the week. And I would invite all of you to come back next month on May 26th at 11 for our first, fourth, I guess I tried to combine fourth and third, our fourth webinar that's gonna be focusing on cognitive neuroscience more broadly. All right, thanks everyone.